Hi everyone and welcome. Calling System Services. From time to time, the programmer might need the system to perform tasks such as getting input from the keyboard, printing messages on the console, retrieving the system date, performing some operations on files, like for example, opening a file to write it or to read it, and much more. This is achieved by executing a system service call, which is like calling a function that is stored within the operating system. However, as system services do not generally use stack-based arguments, they are limited to six functions parameters as only registers can be used. That's not properly true because there are some advanced techniques that would allow us to use more than six parameters, but we won't talk about that. So we would just assume that we can only use six arguments. Each system service is associated to a fixed numeric value, which is to be stored into the RAX register before performing the specific system service call. Tables that show the numeric value of each system service are available for each operating system. Now on Linux, you will need to find these two files, which are going to be telling you the numeric value or the specific system call that you want to execute. On Windows, you need to analyze the NTDLL file that came with your installation. Okay, so we move next. And this is the configuration of the registers. So we're gonna have the system call code, which is going to be in here. And then on the remaining ones, we can store the arguments in this order. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And now we can have a look at the small example. This program can write strings on the console. Now in the RAX, we're going to be storing the code of the syscall that we want to execute. In this case, it's one. One means that we are writing something. In this case, we're writing something on the standard output. If we were to be writing files, we would be still using one over here, but we won't be writing on the standard output. We will be getting the file descriptor over here in the way that we are going to describe in a while. Now, so we said that we are writing something on the console. That's the console, right? And that's the message. And then this is the length of the message, right? Just remember that you need to include the new line if you want, if you want to have a new line, right? And of course, the length of the message has to be including uh, the length of the message, right? So it's going to be your message plus one. And here, something new. If you've been watching my class, you will know that we've been terminating the program with these two lines. But now, something new. And we're going to be explaining this difference in a while. Let's see what happened when we execute this program. Just remember this message over here. And then we can build the program and then we can execute it. Voila, pepperoni pizza. And with a new line, right? We have a new line here, right? So, because for example, I could do this. If I wanted to, I could uh, remove this and do 15 and then I can rebuild it, of course, then execute it again. And in this case, see, 
no new line. Okay, so I guess we are ready to uh, analyze the second example. Now, in this program, we're going to be grabbing the input from the user and then we're going to print the input back on the console. Now, to do that, we need a buffer where to store the input from the user and the buffer is clearly defined in the BSS section because we don't know what the buffer is going to be containing, right? It's a fairly small buffer, just 32. <laughs> and uh, so in here, we are reading, so the call will be zero, as we said before. So if we were reading a file, this would be also zero. But then this one would not be standard input, would be the file descriptor of the file. And then we are writing again on the console, so one, and then input and output. And then again, in here, we have the old way we used to terminate the program and the new one. And we're going to be discussing about this in a second. I guess now what we can do is executing the program. We can have a flash overview over here. Again, these two codes and then the buffer and the buffer size and then we execute the syscall. And this one is exactly the same like we've seen before. And then we can actually execute it. So we build it first. And then we execute it. Uh, I am my friend. I am my friend, right? That's very good. Once again, back in the program. Okay. Analyzing the difference between int and syscall. So this stuff over here, right, goes beyond the scope of this course. However, the instruction int triggers a software interrupt, which is lower. And int is generally always implemented because it's an older instruction. The instructions sysenter and syscall, which of course you can see gotta be newer, do not trigger a software interrupt. And they are also faster, but they are not always implemented because they're new. Now, this is a just a small introduction because there is so much more that we could say about it, but uh, that's not the right course to talk about this. And we move next. Now, the examples show how to read user input and write text to the console, but files are managed using similar instructions. And we, we already talked about this. Again, RAX will be used to store the system call code. When the function returns, this register will contain a negative value if the requested file cannot be opened. So the error code, basically. And this is how we manage the register. So we have this number over here. This is gonna tell us that we are opening or creating a file, file name, and the access flag. Now we are reading file again, zero. File descriptor, and then, oh, overwriting. Others used to store characters to read, and numbers of characters to read. Similarly, and we already covered this, one to write, and then file descriptor, and then 
the rest similarly. So, I hope you've enjoyed my class. Please share and like this video and subscribe and thank you very much.